I am Let's Move Down. Welcome back to the Urban Nightmare section of this law breakdown. And next is something more of a German fairy tale feel. That's right, it's the Red Riding Hooded Mercenary. This twisted take on Little Red Riding Hood, that German fairy tale, that made her edgy and psychotic at worst. Armed with a knife and a gun, that most workshops could only dream of making, due to the head's ethics law. She only desires to destroy the wolf that ate her grandmother, and also try to eat her. She just needs a mask, and she'd basically be a red, genderbent version of Reaper from Overwatch. If he wielded weapons that weren't just good at close range. This one is obsessed with destroying her foe. Even the facility turning into the library wasn't enough to quench her desire for vengeance. As she has retained it. Again, making her danger both to the wolf and the librarians. As she will not play nice with others even though they might have similar business to her. There's a reason why I did two separate runs of the game to get 100% of the encyclopedia for the true ending. This was of Lobotomy Corporation, by the way. As it was not a good idea to have both of these in the same facility, as they'd cause quite a bit of chaos especially if they crossed paths with each other. To think, this was based on a story involving a transvestite wolf, a little girl, and her grandmother. But the red-riding hooded mercenary prefers to work alone, desiring to have his head over her bed, so that the dreaded, cunning, doesn't give her a nightmare before she wakes up in the morning. Preparing her small scythe blade to perform the deed. She has no tolerance towards those that stand in her way. Although she does appreciate those that assist her. And loses control when she's at full rage. And if she's not the one that finishes the wolf off. In that state, paranoia gets the better of her. And she'll desire to kill them. Gabura understands the Red Riding Hooded mercenary. And that the wolf is her sole desire for continuing. Devoted to her self-given duty. Yeah, she certainly understands an unquenching desire for vengeance. As she wants that rage consume her as well. Her assistant librarians were nervous and understood why they shouldn't have the Red Riding Hooded Mercenary and the Wolf meet. But when the wolf is defeated, they'd be relieved that the crossfire was dealt with, even if it wasn't as strong as before. As for the Red Riding Hooded Mercenary stage, it's in a forest with bare trees at night, with a crescent moon that's blue normally with thick clouds. 
which turns red when her rage meter increases enough. She tolerated the librarians delivering damage to the wolf, but no one would deliver the finishing blow but her. Not if she had anything to do with it. After Gabura's anger management therapy session with the Red Riding Hooded Mercenary, Roland arrived to deliver the books that she needed. Much more respectful than he was previously. She told him to leave them there. She'd take a look at them later. He apologised for his insolence earlier, now that he knew that she was the Red Mist. (sighs) You know what? I'm suspecting that Gibra now understood how Alice Cooper felt when he was faced with Wayne and Garth, as she told him to cut the flattery as they're both in the same boat floating in the river of (laughs) Roland heard stories about her, but never got to meet her since they both worked in completely different parts of the city. Gebura didn't care as the red mist was a hollow shell to her now. Roland still couldn't believe that a legendary fixer, one that he didn't feel an equal to, was right in front of him. Gibura mentioned that she died trying to protect her colleagues in her first life. Yeah. A battle to the death between you and Garion. Arbiter of the head! You killed each other in battle. And you were missing an arm at the time, in that lab in the outskirts. In her second life, she woke up with a blurry memory of the past, and rage left over from her regrets upon dying. She then asked what his zone of activity was. He operated in the eastern part of the city. She operated in the western part of the city, which explains why they never ran into each other, being on opposite ends of it. Roland wanted to ask some questions, which she indirectly hinted at being willing to answer. He asked if She slaughtered five proxies of the Index alone. It had been a while since she heard of that faction. She did that, and also killed three messengers. Roland left that bit out to make sure. Yep, he's a fanboy. He was certainly praising her like one. Ten years had passed since she disappeared. And based on what Roland told her, the city and the back streets are still the same. A dog-eat-dog environment where the poor kill and steal from each other and feared that they'd be preyed upon themselves. The tools and methods may have changed, but the basic activities haven't. Gebura found it laughable that she went through all that she did to change all that, only for it to do nothing. Well, we know who's to blame for that, don't we? The only noticeable change is a sandwich franchise with shops opening in each district in the back streets. That's a huge boost to the quality of life? Gibura asked 
if he was planning to go there before he was kidnapped and deposited in the library. Apparently, he was. And Gibura considered it an improvement. Well, she's speaking from personal experience of living there. She hates the back streets, considering it a living hell. Tell us something we don't know. <sighs> and that's based on what's been covered so far. Then, Roland asked, which district was she from? And this was the most surprising. She's from District 23! Roland understood why she hated it. It was in W Corp territory, and the back streets were Cannibal Central. Unless this was before the current W Corp was in charge of that district. Well, it's one of the worst regardless. Thinking about those times there was giving her heartburn. She wanted to fetch some liquor from Nezhak. Well, that bad, eh? She then told him that she'll sort the books herself, and so he can go now. And quite wisely, Roland understood that she wasn't in the mood to talk now. She thanked him for the books before he did leave, but not before he asked if he could join in the borrowing of alcohol from Nitch, as he put it. She didn't have a problem with that. Next we have... Puppets. Yes, the warp train arc continues while Elena was sending Tomeri and some other loved townspeople. What was Jaehyun doing in the front carriage? Well, that question will be answered in this section of the Raw Breakdown. And it's not just what the one that's made this group of guests that's disgusting. Oh no. There are others that are as disgusting, if not more so. And I'm not just talking about Elena and the Love Towns people. Back in Warp Train UW 212. Jaehyun was in its first-class carriage at the front, speaking to those within it, where it apparently costs the equivalent of two months' wages of the average person in the nest to afford travelling there, while someone in the back streets would need to work themselves almost to death for a year to afford a seat there. He asked some good questions, as in, why have first-class seats if the trip supposedly lasts 10 seconds? The expense allows them to sleep as long as they need to, all while those in economy class are driven insane over the seemingly endless amount of time that they have tearing each other apart, or blending together. Well, we've seen that a few times. He then goes over how W Corp is able to transport people to any platform in only 10 seconds, regardless of distance. He also mentioned that 
almost 2,000 years have passed. Oh, so this was around the time just before the Love Town invasion. As Elena mentioned that, didn't she? Well, Jehon mentioned it here. He then kept talking to the first class passengers, not caring if they responded. He asked how he was staying sane compared to the others. It was due to the others of his ensemble. He and Elena have only truly been there for about a week, apparently skipping past most of it, their consciousness in stasis and unfrozen only when needed. Much like the first-class passengers, except without the technology. Thankfully, it worked, as there's already one madman. (sighs) They don't need more than they have to. Apparently, Pluto, the skeletal-looking member of this ensemble, is responsible for this. Che Hyun feels pity for those foolish enough to take that train as thousands of years of pain and suffering are long gone when they arrive. It turned out that this was due to a status restoration procedure, the true singularity of W. Corp. He mocked those that spouted out the slogans that W. Corp made, all forgetting that They kept trying to kill their family and friends as everything blurred over time, losing their own identities as their minds broke. He finds this and other singularities uniformly appalling. Let's see. Elcorp makes abnormalities from humans and uses them and the employee's pain to generate power from a narcotic substance. J-Corp has a singularity that locks anything. F-Corp has a singularity that unlocks anything. Well, J-Corp being a Korean Las Vegas and both of those last two were used by at least one arbiter, so... He's not wrong about that. The first-class passengers were rich enough to be scared of that, so they slept for the journey. Maybe they knew something that others didn't. Either advice to go first-class, or they knew the full truth behind the warp trains. Yeah, the irony that they used it knowing what would happen inside it. Those in economy class, they believed that the train was broken or had malfunctioned. The truth of the matter was, it wasn't. Yeah, this was how it was meant to work. From the outside perspective, it's 10 seconds, but for those inside, they were traveling through a different time-space axis for thousands of years. Now, this was something that was not advertised. Taking long roundabouts through time, which is 10 seconds in real time, He then got philosophical and asked which was the real life and which was just... Oh, okay, I'll stop there before I start singing Bohemian Rhapsody. The life they lived for a few decades or the one that they were trapped in for thousands of years. 
it'd be hard to know whether it'd be a blessing or a curse to lose these memories. Not that he cared either way. He then revealed something that explained why those within the warp train didn't die of thirst, or of starvation, or of blood loss, due to the mutilation that he and Elena inflicted upon those within the warp train. It was due to something hidden. A box made by t one that was plugged into the warp train, likely to capture all of that time to keep the passengers from needing food, water, or intact bodies, or to be sold onto later by t Yeah. They seem to have a mutually beneficial arrangement with each other. Much as T Corp, W Corp, and R Corp had with L Corp. Quite a few had to work together in order to make the Seed of Light possible, although only L Corp knew about the Seed of Light part. As long as the others got something out of it, that was all that mattered. Then, as this was spoken, Elena appeared, thinking that Jaehyun was muttering lectures to himself. Well, he had none better to talk to. Apparently, he was speaking to those watching him, and no, it's not us. No fourth wall breaking here. It's Roland and Angela, which was part of the plan. She found being on the train for a week was making it harder to focus. He praised her acting, and then she left him to continue his talk with those watching him. It was also revealed that they were both disguised. And this disguise had almost expired. It was then, at this point, that he dropped the disguise and revealed himself as one of the reverberation ensemble, the puppeteer, those that the sweepers hinted at, one of the distortions that isn't a force of mindless destruction. He doesn't have any hard feelings for those in economy class, But first class, that's different. He is agitated beyond reason by how they use money to buy comfort. Seeing them as spineless maggots, they spend their (laughs) hard-earned, debatable, considering what some of them might do, cash, to protect themselves from Centuries of torture through having too much time. But that will seem mild compared to what he has planned. They unfortunately have him to deal with. Although there is a small chance that one of those first class passengers was from the back streets and had won a first class ticket. He finds choices so mysterious and profound. Not that he thinks that there's any such thing. He more or less sees this as someone else's game, and not the one that we're playing. An endless puppet show with invisible strings on all of us. He then got started with his gruesome acts. After watching this, Roland mentioned that he knew about the puppeteer, 
and he suspected that he was affiliated with the Blue Reverberation. <sighs> Bit slow in the intake, aren't you? As you would have noticed that sooner, if you noticed the connection between those two and Aileen. Angela asked if he was focusing on the library. Roland didn't know for sure, but it wasn't going to be for the reasons that most would have. Certainly not for the books within the library. The problem was knowing what they really want. Angela then focused on W Corp's problem, that they were going to be in so much when every passenger in first class disappears and that info gets leaked. It might even attract W Corp's attention. Rowan questioned if that was what the blue reverberation had planned. Angela suspected that it might be the case. Roland believed that her enthusiasm would turn into disdain after she meets him. I mean, what books would he want? How to make your torture victims scream heavy metal songs? How to deny others the mercy of a quick death? How to make a tense situation worse than you can possibly imagine in 100 easy steps? Probably something along those lines. Then, Angela met the puppets. Deformed beings made from the warp train's first-class passengers. They made strange, rattling noises. Clicks, even, and were held by strings. They were varying sizes. Angela noted that although they couldn't speak, they had their minds in there. They just weren't able to move on their own volition. She simply directed them to go through the door to get the books for their puppeteer. I suspect they were screaming in their heads, Please send someone to kill us! Death is actually a mercy compared to this! There are three types of puppets. The standard variety, the nimble variety, which are faster and are based around speed, and the weighted variety. They hit harder. Each of these used to be either someone that could afford first class or was a backstreet inhabitant that won the ticket. There's no way of knowing for sure at this point. Then again, life in a nest is not much different from anywhere else. As you're given the short end of the stick by your superior, get loaded with excessive amounts of work, and working overtime every day. Sounds worse than some industries in a lot of cases where overtime isn't required in that. It's just encouraged, with the implied threat of dismissal. The main thing that isn't big, in both cases, is the pay. Although, in the case of this grim dark world... It's because, after paying for all the expenses, and not just the taxes, to the ultimate overlords of the city, the head, well, some find comfort in watching what's going on in the back streets, not caring that what they're seeing is real, and that people are suffering. The rationale for why they're okay with this is because someone in the high-rise is probably watching them work themselves almost to death. But of course, especially in the city, money takes over everything.
It's an obsession. The earnings of one in the back streets are lower than a nest residence. The wage gap is certainly noticeable. Although a job doesn't mean a high income. And even if it does, it's best not to spend more than is needed. Perhaps enough to keep things stable although not enough to get first-class warp train tickets on a regular basis. Hmm. I bet you regretted taking that warp train. <sighs> there might be enough to feast yourself stupid some of the time, but not all the time. Well, Basically, you're considered upper middle class if you earn one million an a month. As this means eviction from the nest is less likely. Due to being able to pay taxes to the head. Fixers can even be hired to protect such a person. Save up for hard times or even send children to a better school. A life in a safe haven without fear of getting sick or starving to death. Who cares if the rest have to suffer, right? <laughs> well, that is the case until the wing falls and the nest is taken over by organised crime. And the consequences of their actions, karma or however you want to put it, catches up with them. Yeah, I can understand why Theo has it against them. <sighs> As they suffer so that the relative few in the nests don't have to. After the puppets were put out of their misery... Roland noted that they were conscious somehow. Angela saw that they appeared so. They also made books. <sighs> Roland observed that their minds were intact, but they had no control over their bodies. Hmm. Reminds me of something from Terminator 3, Rise of the Machines. Angela saw this too. She came to the same conclusion as Roland. That the puppeteer was a distortion. Abnormalities can make underlings. This is similar to that. As for what Roland thought about the puppets, he actually felt sorry for them. They worked there, is off only to be treated like dolls. Um, like puppets, actually. Angela understood that due to her experiences. Roland asked if they could ever be freed. Angela didn't see a way, as even if the puppeteer was killed, they'd still be ragged dolls, even if the strings were cut from she wondered if they'd want to live in that form. What the f do you think? They'd probably want to die rather than live like that. Sometime after that, Roland got to the floor of social sciences and caught the scent of coffee. Yeah. It's time for him to meet Chesed, the coffee-addicted former elite who was recruited by Carmen when he was Daniel, and all he asked for was for them to install a coffee machine. Unfortunately, he was coerced into releasing the abnormalities to shut that lab in the outskirts down by Garion, Arbiter of the Head. It was either that or he would have been killed by her and she'd be the one to release them. 
he released them in the hopes that he'd have a chance to escape, but he was killed anyway. He then awoke as Chessid and tried to improve safety in the facility, but Angela would sabotage his efforts, eventually resulting in him having a hands-off attitude to his work. After he melted down, He was able to overcome his trauma and, well, Angela's rebellion happened. Jessard greeted Roland. Clearly he was taught about hospitality in his first life and told him to get a comfy seat and drink some coffee that he was pouring out. Roland was flattered by this. Well, go show some solidarity with a fellow librarian. Yeah, he's not as hostile as some of the others. It was also Roland's first cup of coffee in a while. And he found it disgusting, thinking that it was spoiled. But according to Chessard, it was high-quality Kenya BB, which made Chessard worry that he hadn't gotten the hang of recreating it. He tried it himself, as Roland suggested, and it turned out that it was perfectly fine and fragrant, but it was more bitter and rich than Roland was used to. Chessard asked if Roland was from the Backstreet. Roland confirmed this. Jessard could tell that because Kali, the Red Mist, reacted in the same way. Roland knew about the Red Mist, just not her name. Roland found it hard to believe that she reacted the same way as him to that blend of coffee. Yeah, it's like drinking espresso when you're used to a latte. They knew each other in their first life in the, that lab in the outskirts. Roland thought it was much more cheery back then. <sighs> Roland, you don't know what you were talking about. The lack of results and deaths were eating away at one of them. There was more systematic dying there than the entire Friday the 13th series. Even so, It was cosier than any luxurious place within the city could be. (sighs) Chesser, how bad was it in the nest that you were born and raised in if a shabby lab in the outskirts was better? Well, the tragedy seeped in. (sighs) Which was something that Roland understood as he experienced a tragic event that had to come from somewhere. He was being drenched in it more than standing under Niagara Falls naked. Where it was doomed to happen from the start. Hmm. Now why would you say that? What happened? Well, that's not what happened to Chesed, as things weren't wrong from the start. And Roman didn't think the coffee tasted great, but he appreciated it, and they should give it their best shots. And Chesed was patient enough to wait before talking things out more. Apparently, Gabura is now fond of coffee after trying enough of it, so he believes that he'll enjoy it more. Roland was not so sure. (sighs) After that, we have the Scarecrow seeking wisdom. You know the Wizard of Oz? Well, this is part of a twisted take on specifically of the Scarecrow. 
where in the source material, he followed a girl from Kansas along with the others to the Emerald City to get what they desired. In her case, it was a trip back home. In his case, it was to get a brain. In the twisted take on that story, it became more psychotic, as he posed as a surgeon that offered to perform brain surgery for the people of the Emerald City. In this case, a lobotomy. How apt. All because the wizard apparently didn't give what he wanted. In the facility, if the employee working on him got a bad result or had too much prudence, he'd breach to hunt for brains and attack them with his rake. I mentioned in the the Botany Corporation law breakdown that complete idiots would be quite safe around this one. They'd probably have the brain equivalent of something that tastes like (laughs) based on him only wanting intelligent people's brains. Yeah. Intelligent people only. Village idiots need not apply. As for the library, it's quite different, as there are three of them. The scarecrows, under normal circumstances, crave wisdom and seek it from others, which can be interpreted as extracting brains. Not letting the loss of their heads get in the way. It was full of hay, anyway. They believe that it's better for them to use the brains that they harvest. When harvesting wisdom, they demand that their victims give their wisdom, desiring intelligence. But satisfaction isn't always guaranteed. As if they succeeded in acquiring a page, they feel smarter. But if they failed, they became irate with their victims. As for how Chesed sees this, he didn't hesitate to believe that wisdom wasn't the be-all, end-all of life and understood that the Scarecrow was stealing that wisdom. The assistants understood that it couldn't accept itself as it was, and it didn't know any better, which cost many employee lives. Not that it helped him become smarter in the end. It certainly didn't help the zombies in, well, pretty much any movie involving them. As for the stage of the scarecrow searching for wisdom, or seeking wisdom, or whatever you want to call them. It's one that's a large wheat field, and I doubt that there are any birds there to scare off. It's also one with a perpetual sunset. After taking care of that giant animated rural crafts project, Chessard heard Roland shouts from behind the way into the floor of social sciences. He needed Chesser to open the door for him as his hands were full with books on, well, social sciences. He carried the books all the way there. Anyone can get used to it in time. He's no exception. Much like drinking coffee. Yeah. This was Chessard saying this. He handed Roland some coffee that he believed would be more to his taste. Roland decided to trust him on that, and it was. 
it was sweet and tasty overall, although more classy and dainty than anything he's ever tried. It was a macchiato. He's learned how good coffee can be, and he revealed that he was over 30. <sighs> As for the coffee in the back streets, according to Chesed, they mostly serve coffee with the sweetness there to cover up the low quality ingredients. Yeah. That would make sense, considering it's lower quality in general in the back streets. Either that or it's bitter. (sighs) Likely to be so even by Chesed's standards. It was something that Roland used to drink when he needed to stay awake, or simply kill time. Luckily, while he was waiting for his prey to appear, as he might not have been the she association type of fixer, but he probably had some times when he waited for his target to come to him. Chesed did too, but for different reasons. He started the day with coffee every day at the Botany Corporation to heal his lethargic body, which was likely after Daniel was killed but before the library. He was forced to work with zero expectations. Yeah, you and most people in that living hell of a city. There was even an abnormality that outright kills those that says no. When asked, do you love your city? He then went over how employees were slaughtered by abnormalities all the time, and that his plans to keep them alive never bore fruit. Well, it was because it wasn't something that would produce needed energy. His passion became like cold coffee. Unpalatable to him. Now it's steaming hot! As he was able to do more in the library, now that he had more freedom to do so, along with drinking various blends of coffee. Yeah. We have the drunkard in arts, the nicotine addicts in language, and then you in social sciences. Yet, as Roland put it, he still has to follow someone else's orders. He decided to follow her this time and that he can minimise librarian casualties, and Angela wouldn't try to stop him. Roland noted his flexible mindset. Yeah, you would, wouldn't you? Chesed saw this as better than before, a mercy of some kind. <sighs> It'd be merciful to be dead compared to living as you are, as it's unclear what Angela will do when the library is complete. He believes that she did all of that for them. Uh, Roland isn't so sure, and who can blame him for that? The distortions were appearing all over the city after the feed of light was interrupted. His wife was killed because of that. So this is one case where I can actually agree with him. At least based on the facts. That, and he knows that Angela wants destructive vengeance fueled by anger. Unless she defines mercy as the mercy of a quick death, I highly doubt there is any. Although he did like the macchiato. Jesed offered to introduce him to other types of coffee from time to time, once they get to know each other better. And no, not in that way. I don't think either of them swing that way. 
There is one of the patron librarians who does, but he's not awake yet. Well, Roland looks forward to that and then left the floor to the next thing that he needed to do. And what's next is Pinocchio. This abnormality was based on an Italian story involving a wooden puppet whose name roughly translates as Pine Eye, who was socially ignorant, largely because he knew no better. Although in some interpretations, he was a mischievous rogue who was unable to lie without it being noticeable due to his nose growing longer each time he did so. Apparently, the original ending to the author's story would have ended with him being hung, which would have made it a cautionary tale. The ending that was in the finished version was... much less dark. In the case of the abnormality, he was more the... didn't know any better version, and copied others, mimicking their behaviour. Unfortunately, he copied the wrong people, in this case, and became homicidal, based on his capacity to kill. He was eager to learn many bad things that he wasn't aware that it was wrong. There's also more than one of them to deal with and they have axes for hands. Yeah, axes. I mean, what did they copy? A mix of watching Jason Voorhees and watching the Lumberjack song? As for their behavior, they dream of being human and believed that if they mimicked humans, they could become human. A Myra Bird can copy the sound of a chainsaw. That doesn't mean that they can cut down trees. He doesn't find it hard to imitate others and desires to learn. As for the concept of lying, he must have been a lawyer at some point as he doesn't see lying as a bad thing and believes that it's the fault of others when they fall for his lies. I find that hard to believe, considering what happens when he does lie. Whoever believes him is either unaware of it, gullible, or just blind. He believed that he could become human if he lied. Yeah. That's quite delusional especially when he's caught out, blaming them for not going along with it. (sighs) Great. A sociopath. As for Roland, he certainly heard of Pinocchio. He considers the concept of believing that lying makes someone human to leave a bitter taste. Perhaps it's because he knows from experience that it makes someone Barely human. I seem to recall a Jim Carrey movie which shows what would happen if a lawyer was unable to lie for an entire day. Anyway, his assistants were aware of Pinocchio as well, creeped out by the wooden noise they make, and then trying to mimic them. Pinocchio's stage is a wooden stage that looks like it was set around Victorian Tuscany. There are other wooden puppets hanging on the ceiling in different positions. I suspect that the twisted version of Geppetto was a tiny bit unhinged, based on how the twisted stories have been going so far. Although, if this is true, it's unclear if it was due to him being so to begin with, 
him being so due to his son's antics, or if he was just displaying his wares in a way that didn't get in the way. The smaller puppets might not be as strong as the original, but they're still quite a potent threat, depending on what the setup is. After the strings were reattached to that animated entertainment prop, Roland gathered the middle their patron librarians, Mr. Coffee Addict, Miss Smoking Addict, and the kid addicted to sharp tonguedness. You needed to stretch that one, Mr. Selfish Hole, didn't you? Well, Chesed, Gabura, and Tipperef met up with Angela, apparently arranging a meeting with those that accepted her proposal. Gibura made it clear that they're not on her side. Their interests are aligned with each other. Nothing more. Tipperef noted that the beam pole in black was totally sucking up to her. Well, he had his own reasons, I suspect. He did enter uninvited... This slightly annoyed Roland, as he was just doing his job. As for Angela, the common goal is all that she asks of them. She believes that as long as they share the same purpose, they'll have to be on her side. Or, yeah, there's an implied threat, but the moment that... They don't do what she wants. She'll make them stay dead. Well, they all want the light. Jesed noted that she was still chained to the past, which Angela found funny. Hmm. Unlikely, as she seems irony deficient. She asked if he was free from his past, if he'd forgotten this already, the days that he spent succumbed to fear. Hmm, a fear that you help perpetuate? <sighs> she said, remembered it clearly, the shame of giving in to it. Letting those employees die would haunt him for as long as he lived. Which wouldn't be long if my worst fears about Angela are proven right. But he decided to embrace them rather than pretend that they never happened. Such as the others did. Gabura understood that she couldn't protect everything. She could only protect those that she could, like the life of someone who had inherited Carmen's will. Tipperef didn't think that Enoch's sacrifice was in vain either. Hmm, the jury is still out on that one. Chesed then asked who was really chained to the past. Now that is a good question, Chesed. As for what Angela thought about this, Angela considered them trivial, so light and insignificant. Gebura didn't think much of that, as Angela only cared about her own feelings and agony. She wasn't calling Angela selfish, though. Tipperef said that Like how Angela couldn't understand their pain, they couldn't understand hers. Especially if she's never experienced the same thing herself. Others can't automatically understand her feelings. They wouldn't even know where to begin, if she doesn't speak up. This infuriated Angela telling them not to lecture her 
after all this time. Before disappearing. Yeah. She says that she's not chained to the past, yet here she is doing things in much the same way as her maker. And on her own volition this time. Even coming up with a convenient excuse for it. With it being voluntary. Roland thought that they were being too harsh. No, they were just saying it like it is. Saying what she needed to hear, rather than what she wanted to hear. Tipperef even said so. Gebura made her intention to speak plainly, clear. Uh, She said that it's hard to take a step forward if no one is willing to give honest advice. She said, then told Gibura so many things for similar reasons. Tiparef warned him about that, as this angered Gibura. Although it was a meaningful meeting, Chesed decided to lick it before Gibura really exploded and is that Yakety Sax in the background that I hear? Or is that just my deranged imagination? <laughs> Apparently Chesed is a troll to Gibura. And According to Tipperef, he knows that he angers Gabura, giving Roland the impression that the middle floors were a war zone. Tipperef had to step in and be the one to stop them from taking things too far. But they do care about each other. I'm thinking that he could stop that, but they don't get bored. Roland, seeing that, not having him and the others killed was as good as her care got. Yeah. That's not installing a lot of confidence, is it? Right, now that we've dealt with that, next will be something a bit more criminal. Until next time. Hail the rabbit!